So this slide presentation here is about parenting your defiant child. And, um, and uh, the question is, is it that they won't do something or that they can't do something? And how do you tell and how do you handle it? So today we're going to talk about the shift from feeling calm to feeling threatened and back to calm. We're going to talk about bottom-up versus top-down behaviors. And we're going to have some strategies for how to help kids shift from feeling threatened back to feeling calm. Okay, we're going to start with how your body respond, responds to a feeling of being threatened. I always have some caveats when I present this because we're learning that, um, you know, people used to talk about uh, the lizard brain, the mammalian brain, and the human brain. And... Uh, then they shifted to talking about survival brain, emotional brain, and thinking brain, and they talked about these different centers of the brain. Um, now we know that these are actually networks in the brain, but I find it a useful metaphor for thinking about um, different phases of self-regulation. So let's start with what, what we call the survival brain. Um, the brain stem and the cerebellum are very old parts of the brain, and they are in charge of keeping us alive. Um, basically, if they feel like your body, or your, your body, I guess, is in, in danger of being not alive, that you need to figure out a way to stay alive. And so you sort of have three options. One is fight. And if that's not going to work, run away. And if neither of those are going to work, then freeze um, is basically a, a shutdown of your system so that you can dissociate from feeling um, pain if something horrible happens. Um, the emotional brain is the you know, what used to be called the mammalian brain. Um, people used to think it was the limbic system, but like I said, it's a network in the brain. But it's where emotions and memories and habits um, are processed. And these are responsible for instinctually based decisions. So these are um, things that you have learned, like when you go outside and it's sunny, maybe you'll need to squint your eyes in order to be able to see or something like that. Um, these are decisions that you make about how to respond to the world. Um, and you have a little more control over them based on your previous experiences. The last part of the brain that we're going to talk about is the thinking brain, and this is the neocortex, so the outer part of the brain, and in human beings, the neocortex is it's the biggest part of our brain. And this is where language and imagination and abstract thought all happen. Um, Language, imagination, and abstract thought do not happen in the emotional brain, and they do not happen in the survival brain. What happens is when you are calm and regulated, all three parts of these brain systems work together. You're monitoring for what you need to do to survive. You're responding to habitual things in ways that don't require much thought. And you're taking in new information and making decisions about how to handle that with your neocortex. So all three brain systems are online at the same time. Basically, Dan Siegel, if you go on YouTube and type in Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, you will see a lovely video of a brain. And I'm going to describe to you what this GIF is supposed to be doing, which is um, you can think of this model of the brain as your hand. And when your fingers represent the neocortex, your thumb, which is wrapped inside your fingers, represents that limbic system, um, the emotional brain. And then your wrist and, um, you know, the base of your hand, those are uh, the, the, the survival brain. And what happens is uh, Dan Siegel talks about flipping your lid so you, you can lift your fingers up off of your palm so that your thumb is showing. <laughs> and so what that says is, you know, you detect some threat. Your neocortex, that thinking part of your brain, the creative part of your brain, goes offline, leaving only the emotional and memory processing habitual responses and the survival brain. If you get further dysregulated, that emotional and memory processing stuff goes offline, and you're left only with survival brain, which is fight, flight, or freeze. And they come back online in the same order. So if you are in fight, flight, or freeze, um, then your limbic system or the, that emotional brain, the ability to process 
habitual things and so on comes back online and then the neocortex comes back online so that everything's working together. So it's a really nice metaphor um, for teaching your kids this idea of, you know, uh, this hand model of the brain. This is a, um, a graph of how dysregulated a kid or an adult might be over time. So going up and down on this axis is how dysregulated you are and then going across from left to right is the prevention strategies and time. So what happens is um, you start out in the teachable moment. So for example, um, you know, everything's going fine. Your all three parts of your brain are working together. Everything's going great. You're able to understand what people are saying to you. You're able to think creatively about how to solve problems and so on. And then where that first dotted line comes in, all of a sudden, um, something happens and you start rumbling or your kid starts rumbling. So, you know, when all three parts of the brain are online, everybody's calm and happy, but then something happens and you start feeling bad or your kid starts feeling bad. That's because you flipped your lid, okay? So that, that neocortical region has gone offline and the emotional brain has come online. So the, it was online before, but it's, it's the one that's running the show. If, as a parent, you can figure out what triggered the thinking brain to go offline and address it, your child will calm back down and they'll go back into being able to process language and you know think creatively about how to solve problems and so on. But if you cannot figure out what happened, then they're going to get more and more dysregulated until they pro pass that second dotted line there, which I call the point of no return. Um, at this point, uh, the emotional brain goes offline and you shift into survival brain. And the survival brain um, is fight, flight, or freeze. And the person who came up with this, this idea, this rumble rage cycle, is a woman named Brenda Smith Miles. And she has a book called High Functioning Autism in Difficult Moments. And while she originally came up with this for autistic kids, it turns out it pretty much applies to all human beings. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, the, she talks about the rage, you know, where you are literally in fight, flight, or freeze mode, that survival brain, okay? The rage can last, you know, 30 seconds, or it can last, for some kids, days. Um, when you're in survival brain, there's no rational thought happening whatsoever. Um, if you, as the parent, can avoid re-triggering um, anything, then eventually they're going to get through the rage and start calming down. And that emotional brain will come back online and they'll shift past that third dotted line into what's called recovery. Um, during this phase, kids often feel terrible about what happened during the rage because they often say or do very hurtful things during the rage. And as they move into recovery, then that emotional brain comes online and they're either so embarrassed by what happens that they want nothing to do with anybody. And so they go hide and they don't want to talk to you. They don't want to do anything or they want comfort. They want to know that even though they just did these horrible things, they actually really um, need to, to know that you still love them, even though they lost control like that. And if you can avoid, you know, re-triggering anything, then you'll go past that last dotted line and the thinking brain will come back online and then all parts of the brain will be working and then you can talk about what's going on. So what works during each of these phases? Um, so, you know, I talked about the different areas of the brain that are the different systems in the brain that are active at those different times. And because of what's going on during that, then different strategies work at different points in the cycle. So when all three brain regions are working fluidly together, then you can brainstorm and think about what you might do. So this is one reason we talk to parents about 
um, anticipating situations that are going to be difficult for a child to navigate. So for example, my son does not like loud concerts at all. And we used to love going to <laughs> music festivals and um, we would wanted him to share that with us, but he does not like that. He does not enjoy that. It is very overwhelming to him. But outside of the moment, we could say to him, Hey, we're gonna. We're thinking of going to a music festival tomorrow. You know, what do you think we could do about that? And we can brainstorm about it and think about. You know, maybe you should wear noise canceling headphones. Maybe you could wear earplugs. You know, maybe you could um, not go. Um, so these are all options. But you know, they can think and so on because all three parts of their brain are working fine. And likewise, after something's over, they might be able to talk about what happened. Uh, during that, that that led to the meltdown. Um, so uh, during during the rumble, the thinking brain has gone offline. And one of the things that parents very often do during that phase is they will start talking to their kid. Hey, I see you're losing it. You know, you need to get in control. What's going on? Can you tell me what's happening? Please, you know, like, let's figure something out. But their creative problem solving brain has gone offline and their ability to understand what you're saying has gone offline. And by the way, that's a physiological thing. So um, your middle ear, actually, the ear canal, like, uh, constricts and sound can't get in um, when you shift into uh, the rumble and the rage. Uh, so it's actually harder to hear what people are saying. It sounds like it's a million miles away. Um, if you've ever been that dysregulated or remember being that dysregulated, then you, you remember like sound sounds like it's coming from very far away. Um, so the, um, then when you are in the rage, nothing logical is happening at all. So you can comfort your kid when they're in the rumble, but once they trip over into the rage, you're, you're, you, all you can do is keep everyone safe. So sometimes that means like locking yourself in the bathroom or, you know, I don't know what, but, uh, you know, keeping sharp things away from them, things like that. So you, your, your goal during a rage is to keep everyone safe because there is nothing rational happening there and there are no habits or, you know, emotional soothing that's going to work during rage. You really just have to keep everyone safe. Um, then, you know, again, during recovery, comforting may work. They may also want to hide. Um, and so you need to respect that. But, you know, comforting is, is a good thing to try because that emotional brain has come back online. And then eventually you get back into that thinking works part. So one thing to remember is that, um, you know, I talked about the rumble. And very often when I talk about the rumble, parents say to me, um, my kid doesn't have a rumble. They go from being fine to being completely bananas, and I don't have any uh, idea that it's coming. And this can happen for two reasons. So one thing that can happen is they can start rumbling, but they're trying to hold it together, right? So they're trying, trying so hard to hold it together and figure out how to, um, you know, how to uh, not can fly into a rage or whatever. And then at some point they just can't hold it together anymore and blammo, there you go. So that's one thing that can happen. The other thing that can happen is that that rumble, like uh, a, re a reaction, a big reaction can be triggered without a warning. So what you'll find is something happens the kid feels upset. They feel like somebody's upset with them or they feel like um, they've disappointed someone or, you know, they, they feel like somebody doesn't like them for some reason. And they can also just go from zero to 50 in no, no time at all. So that's what this would look like. There's hardly any rumble and then there's uh, a long rage and then eventually you move back through recovery in a teachable moment. So that can be very hard to navigate. I find in ADHD that this often happens where there's a, a flash. So this quote I have here because what happens is kids are not really always able to tell you what's going on inside their head. They can't tell you that they're starting to get upset. The only way they have to communicate with you is 
you know, their body starts getting dysregulated and you're looking at it happening and you're thinking, uh oh, something's wrong. So one of the I, I always say one of the biggest jobs of, a, of growing up is learning to to know in your body that you're about to lose it or that you're getting upset or know what upsets you and figure out how you're going to self-regulate through that upsetness. So we talked about kids on those last ones, but there's also the parents who have their own rumble rage cycle. And um, Brenda Smith Miles uh, has on this graph, she has that adult curve, which you can see um, the child curve is the top one, the adult curve is the one in the middle. And you know, one of the things that she, she talks about is that if you as the adult can stay calm while your child is losing it, they will calm down much faster. Um, so they sort of uh, take in your energy. This is very, very hard to do because as, as human beings, we are wired to respond in kind to the emotions that are coming at us from our kids. So, you know, the kids, you know, are flying through the rumble rage. And guess what? You as the parent are going to have your own rumble rage. But I think most parents know if they can manage somehow to stay calm through that, their kids do calm down faster. And that's because, you know, just as you are mirroring their emotions, they also mirror your emotions. So if you can stay as calm as possible while your child is, is going through the rumble rage and recovery cycle, they're going to calm down faster. Um, I like to joke that I would be a better mom if I were a robot because then I could stay perfectly calm, but it's very, very hard to do, partly because we're wired that way. So here are some strategies you can use to um, think about how to help your child calm down in the moment. So the first one is uh, be the thermostat, not the, the thermometer. I learned this from Jackie Flynn, who is a therapist um, in I don't know where she's located actually, but anyway, she's an amazing therapist. And, uh, and you know, she talks about how if you're a thermometer, you're reacting to the temperature, the emotional temperature around you, and you're reflecting precisely what's going on around you. So if your kid's losing it, you're losing it too. But if you think about what a thermostat does, when the temperature starts to go up, then you, turn on the air conditioning and cool it down. And so you figure out how to, you know, stay calm yourself so your child can stay calm. And so the idea is you make adjustments to what you're doing to help your child make adjustments. So you wanna be that th thermostat and not the thermometer. Last but not least here, we have the child versus the parent. Sometimes you as the parent are going through your own rumble rage here in the blue line and your kid calms down and you're still rattled. You're still feeling really not clear about, you know, you're having big feelings. Maybe you're upset about what happened while they were in the rage. And so you're taking a longer time to calm down than they do. This is particularly problematic when kids come to you while you're still feeling very dysregulated and say that they want um, you know, to be, they want to know that you still love them and you're not necessarily feeling very loving in that moment. And that can be very, very difficult. Um, and I've learned in those moments to say to my kids, you know what, I'm still kind of upset about what happened back there. I just need some time to chill out and calm down and then I can talk to you. All right, now we want to talk about the idea of bottom up versus top down behaviors. And this is getting into this can't versus won't. So when we talk about top-down versus bottom-up behaviors, um, a lot of times um, when our kids have a big reaction like that, we can interpret it as them um, trying to uh, make something happen that they want to happen. So uh, you're in the grocery store and they have candy when you're checking out and your kid wants candy, so they pitch a fit so you'll buy candy because you don't want to be embarrassed in the grocery store. And they know if they lose it, they can get a candy bar and they'll be happy. That is an example of what we call top-down behavior, where you make a conscious decision to behave in a particular way and and then you behave that way and then you get something that you want. So this is, uh, this is, this is 
when a kid does something and you're saying they won't do something, you know, they refuse to do their homework, they are not doing something um, because they don't want to or because they want to get something. That's a top-down kind of behavior. The other kind of behavior is bottom-up behavior. Bottom-up behavior is when your body goes through this cycle that I just described of shifting from all the brain regions being online to, you know, through losing control of your thinking brain to losing control of your emotional brain to being guided fully by your fight, flight, or freeze system. That is bottom up behavior. That's behavior that is driven by something biological, you're feeling threatened, you're feeling like you can't do something, and you just have this big reaction. That is a bottom-up behavior, and it is not designed to get something you want. So the top-down thinking is thoughtful and slow and rational. Hmm, I think I might want that candy bar over there. It's deliberate and intentional. If I scream really loud right now, my mom's going to be really embarrassed and she'll let me have that candy bar so that she won't be embarrassed by the fact that I'm screaming. Um, and if it's a top-down behavior, you as the parent can say before you go into the grocery store, something like, hey, we've got chocolate ice cream at home. If you can hold it together you know, in the grocery store and help me out with everything, then when we get home, we can have as much chocolate ice cream as you want or whatever. That is a behavior modification strategy. You're asking them to behave in a particular way and they are able to use their thinking brain to uh, you know, decide how they're going to respond to a particular situation. This is contrasted to bottom-up thinking, which is reactive and automatic. So if um, somebody is making you do something you're scared of, um, so uh, maybe jump into a swimming pool and you don't know how to swim, okay? So a bottom-up behavior would be reactive or automatic, okay? So if somebody pushes you into the pool, right, you're going to have this automatic reaction of, becoming dysregulated. It is instinctual, it is unintentional, and it is a survival-based stress response. So you're gonna shift into maybe emotional brain or straight into fight, flight, or freeze, right? Because you need to make sure you don't drown in the swimming pool. Um, Bottom-up behaviors respond to understanding and compassion and helping the individual feel safe. So if somebody pushes you into the pool and somebody else comes over and grabs you and, and swims with you to the side of the pool so you don't drown and keeps your head above water, like you will feel better and you will not be as upset as you were before. But if somebody says to you, you can't swim, I'm going to push you into the pool and if you don't lose it, then I will give you chocolate ice cream later, that's not gonna work because it is ruled by your emotional brain and your, you know, safe, you know, your brain that, that your survival brain that, that keeps you alive. So then the question is, when you have a kid who is not doing something that you think needs to be done, the question is, is it can't, which is, you know, they can't do it and so they're feeling upset about it, versus they won't do it. Um, skill, you know, so if you can't do something, then maybe you don't have the skills. You don't know how to swim, right? Versus will. I can, you know, if, if they, they won't go swimming because they're mad at you or something like that, but they are actually really good swimmers, that's a won't situation. So one thing that we want to do is we want to think about behaviors as if they are can't and trying to think about what are the skills that are missing. So in this view of the world, and Ross Green is one of my big heroes, um, he has this quote, he wrote a wonderful book called The Explosive Child, which I did not read because my older child was not explosive. And then when my younger child came along and he was very explosive, I read it and I thought, oh my goodness, I should have read this book one for my other kid because he's a freezer and my younger son is definitely a fighter or a runner. Um, but anyway, he has a, a book called Raising Human Beings to address that issue that I had where I did not read his book because I didn't think I had an explosive child. Um, but anyway, this quote he has is, 
Challenging behavior is just a signal, the fever, the means by which the kid is communicating that he or she is having difficulty meeting an expectation. The model here is that kids are doing well if they can. So, so if your kid can swim and you push them into the pool, they will not lose their marbles. But if they cannot swim, if they are missing that skill, then they're going to have a rough time. And the fact of the matter is that parents are trying their best to, and sometimes we have a hard time holding it together ourselves. And sometimes we don't know how to help our kids. Um, so that that's, you know, give yourself some grace there. We're all doing the best we can. So now that you have this concept down of skill versus will, and you've got this idea of can't versus won't, top down versus bottom up behaviors, and then this idea of the rumble rage cycle, let's talk about how to help your kid. So the first thing that I like to do is I like to remember that my child is not giving me a hard time. My child is having a hard time. And by the way, that might even be true for the kid in the supermarket who wants that candy bar. They're having a hard time. They are not sitting there thinking, how can I embarrass my mom or dad the most? They're thinking, um, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, I'm having a hard time, okay? And this, um, my friend Penny Williams, who uh, is my co-conspirator on the, the behavior revolution, this is one of her favorite parenting state, uh, sayings. And it, it really helps me to keep this in mind. When my kids are losing it, they are having a hard time. It's not aimed at me. They're not trying to be little boogers. They're just having a rough time. All right, so now we're gonna talk about ways to help your child calm down. And I talked about this idea of if your child was going through the rumble rage and you are mirroring what's happening to them, um, you are co-escalating with them, right? So you are reacting to them and you are modeling to your children just what you don't want them to do. So we say to them, you need to calm down, except we're shouting at them, you know, you need to calm down. And it's kind of not helpful because basically you're modeling the fact that you can't stay calm. And that's very, very hard. I, believe me, I understand that it's hard to, to do that. But what it does is it actually adds fuel to the intensity and it just makes them more and more dysregulated um, because they think you cannot handle their big emotions. So co-regulation is what I was talking about earlier when I said you as a parent can make the decision to try to stay calm. So being a calm parent is modeling for your child how you want them to behave. So if you can just take a deep breath and think, okay, my kid is losing it, I'm gonna be okay, I'm just gonna stay calm here, you are modeling for them what you want them to do. You want them to also be calm, right? You are also offering calm for your child to attune to. So your child can um, connect with that feeling of calm that they feel coming from you, as, and that will dampen the fire, as opposed to adding fuel to the fire, which is what happens when you co-escalate. Another strategy that can be very helpful um, in co-regulation is moving in a way that gets your, your child moving with you. So an example of this is when you have a little baby and a baby is crying, one of the first things we do is we will start rocking as parents. You might, you know, if you're standing up, you might rock back and forth. You might take a walk. Um, you'll note that both of these things are rhythmic movements that, um, and the child is moving with you, even though you're holding them next to you, they're moving with you. And these are very calming things. So, you know, this, this is one that it just depends on your kid. Co-regulation works better when your kid is in emotional brain. Once they're in, you know, the rage or, or just, you know, survival brain, co-regulation is a little harder to implement because you might get hurt. But if you can catch them um, while they're rumbling or during recovery, doing something like rocking with them or, you know, holding their hands, swinging back and forth, things like that. Um, you know, telling a kid, let's go for a walk together. That's a wonderful way to sort of interrupt a rumble um, when it starts happening. But this moving together and using rhythm 
is a form of co-regulation and it's very helpful for de-escalating a child who's upset. The next thing is you want to help your child feel safe, okay? So when your child starts to lose it, if you can face them and not look away, um, then that is something we do when we're not feeling threatened by other people. So if your kid's having a big reaction, one of the things you might do is turn your head away and kind of move back from them, right? If they're starting to have a big reaction, sort of, you know, move away, right? And what that does is it sends the message to them that you're not feeling safe and that because they're co-regulating with you, then they feel less safe. So you wanna try to face them and make sure that your body and your face are communicating acceptance and caring. So the message here is, um, you know, you, my child, may be very out of control right now, but I, your parent, am calm and I am here for you. You want to convey that message to your kid. So make sure your body and your face are communicating acceptance and caring. You want to, if you talk, remember they really can't understand anything you're saying. So you want to speak quietly and melodically. This sounds counterintuitive, but you know, one reason people talk to babies in a sing song voice, oh, now are you, oh, you feel bad now, right? That's, that's using um, uh, more, pro it's called prosody, but it's the melody and rhythm of language. And what happens is, as, as a kid moves through the stages of dysregulation, you have to step up those cues that of, of calm in your voice. So you're gonna speak in that more melodic way that they can tune into the acoustics of that even if they can't hear the words that you're saying. You wanna move using gentle, fluid gestures, maybe reaching out to them, um, communicating that, that, you know, I, I can give you a hug if that's what you want right now. The idea is you didn't do anything wrong. Your, ch your kid wants to feel like they didn't do anything wrong and their body responded as it's wired to do. The other thing you want to do is maybe change the environment. So, you know, if there's soft music with ranging vocal melodies, this is why, you know, in a, you may uh, uh, find that they play Muzak, for example, in grocery stores because they're trying to keep people from rioting about not finding their favorite mac and cheese, I don't know. Um, but, you know, you change the environment. So soft music with ranging vocal melodies actually triggers the parts of the brain, um, that, that uh, thinking brain and the emotional brain to come back online. And you also want to dampen any low frequency sounds. So it turns out that, you know, I talked about the middle ear constricting earlier and, um, the, what happens is that that amplifies the low frequency sounds, which is something that happens when you are being threatened. So if the lion is roaring at you or the thundering elephant is running at you, there are these big low frequency boom, boom, roar sounds, and those trigger a feeling of discomfort in us. Now, one of the things I, I feel compelled to say, and it's not fair, but it is a thing, is that some people just naturally have you know, big booming voices. And I see this happen with dads a lot of the time where they um, they are, you know, trying to talk to their kid and they just have big booming voices and their kids feel threatened by them. This is not fair, it is not fair, it is, but if you can try to figure out a way to sort of make your voice more melodic and less choppy, that's one way to address that. But just be aware that kids become hypersensitive to these low frequency sounds. The idea here is you want to help your child feel calm and safe. You are expressing empathy. So I was mentioning going to uh, you know music festival or something like that. Um, then you know you want to be empathetic and responsive. Oh, right, we're here at this music festival. I forgot yet again that you really do not like the loud music at all, and I feel terrible about that. That I forgot that, and I know it makes you upset. So that's being empathetic. You know, I I know you are feeling upset because it's loud here. You want to have those engaging facial expressions. So you know, think about you know how can you look 
inviting. The expression on your face should be inviting and not mad or freaked out or any other way your face might look that would communicate to your child that, that you don't feel safe and therefore they should not feel safe. I mentioned that tone of voice, so that soothing tone of voice inviting and slow pace so that's the other thing is often if a kid is getting upset they start moving more quickly and their body you know motions may be jerkier and if we're responding in kind that may happen to our motions as well but in what you actually want to do is slow down so you're communicating this feeling of calm and slow pace that you have time to get through this if the child has shifted all the way into freeze, which is the deepest state of dysregulation, you can use that exaggerated prosody that I was talking about in the last slide. The, oh, I see you're really upset. You know, so, so that's exaggerated prosody. Another thing to remember is behaviors don't happen in isolation. So every behavior has an antecedent, and every behavior has a consequence. So the example in this slide is a kid is asked to write and maybe they don't have the skill to write. So maybe your kid has trouble with handwriting. Maybe their handwriting looks really sloppy compared to their peers, so they're embarrassed by it. They get asked to write and so they avoid it. So maybe, you know, the teacher says, okay, now we're gonna write in our journals or we're gonna write, you know, a few sentences or something like that and the kid, has a behavior, maybe they, you know, say, I'm not gonna do this and crumple their paper up and throw it on the ground. So that's avoiding writing. And a consequence of that might be the teacher says, well, you're gonna go to the principal if you can't behave yourself. And the, the, the child is like, yes, that's awesome. Now I don't have to write, right? So that's a, an example of getting out of writing. So the behavior of crumpling up the paper and throwing it on the ground, is is actually serving a, a purpose here which is to get them out of writing so thinking about what's triggering a behavior either the thing you know asking you to use a skill you don't have or a consequence which is that you don't have to do the thing you don't want to do those are both things that can you know trigger behavior so thinking about what's going on in the kid's mind that is making them behave that way can also help you get to the bottom of how to help them. All right, so here are some ways to create calm in yourself so that you can try to stay calm. Okay, so creating calm here, um, one thing is uh, do a reality check. So if you assume that the child is not being willful or stupid or lazy, then, but rather that they're having a hard time. So this is the, you know, that your child is not giving you a hard time, they are having a hard time. That reality check um, can help you, um, then, then you're gonna feel calmer. The second one is a strategy I call Q-tip, quit taking it personally. This isn't about you, this is about your kid. Your own emotions about their behavior, don't matter. You're trying to help your kid navigate something that they're upset about. Third thing, remember I talked about lagging skills. So you want to help them figure out how to develop those skills so that when they encounter a similar situation in the future, they, they will be able to navigate it more effectively. Collaborating with your child. So Ross Green talks about collaborative and proactive solutions um, in his book, and he has really nice framework for that. Um, then you can work with your child, even with when they are challenging you. So if a kid's having a rough time, if you can think, okay, how can we work together to figure out how to make this work? That that will, you know, end up being more successful. And last but not least. You're not giving up control by doing this, okay? You can main, maintain control of the situation without yelling or slamming or threatening. It's actually more uh, impressive if you can control the situation by being very calm and getting everybody through it as calmly as possible. Last but not least, just remember that we're none of us parents or kids 
are perfect. We are all beautifully complex, and it's our job to figure out that complexity and marvelously imperfect. Um, the first one is when they're done with their rage, is it normal that their child, um, when they are calmed down and they're at that teachable moment, um, that they don't forget, I mean, they, that they forgot what happened in, during that moment of rage? Oh my goodness, yes. So sometimes when you ask kids what they remember, they don't remember anything. They don't remember what happened. And um, I, something I learned from adults who have trouble with emotion control is that very often they experience it as a blackout. So they will actually say, I literally can't remember anything that happened during the rumble or the rage. Like they, they have no insight into how they behaved. And this is why trying to ask them to be rational and to calm down and so on, it just doesn't work. The part of the brain that processes that is completely offline. Not everybody loses it to that degree that it's just a blackout, but it's definitely a thing. And it's definitely, um, you know, if they say they can't remember, they really probably can't remember. And this is a case where you as a parent are just going to have to start being a detective to figure out those antecedents that might have triggered it. This person is wondering about what to do when their child is violent, which happens often when he's dysregulated and they have to leave uh, the room more than once for their own sa safety. Is there any way to make him feel safe while actually keeping themselves safe? Boy, is that a great question. And I, I, this is highly individual. So if the kid is really out of control um, and you know, flinging furniture and things like that, you really may have to just leave the room and let the damage happen. I, I do find from my point of view as a parent, like if I say I can't handle my own emotions right now and I need to leave to stay safe, right? And then I walk out and I shut the door or lock myself in the bathroom or whatever. Um, and they're going to wreak havoc. <laughs> like that's just part of what goes on. Um, because anytime you, you, you try to engage then they're, they're going to have a hard time with that. And if you are truly at danger, you know, the thought of, I mean, sometimes people are very out of control and they do very hurtful things. You know, I've had families I've worked with where the kid has, you know, broken a parent's nose in a rage. Um, I've had kids who have really hurt their parents. Um, I actually know a mother of an adult who um, her kid actually killed her um, in a rage. So you have to take these things very seriously. Now, this child was much, much bigger than his mother. He was an adult and he had a lot of self-control issues. Younger kids don't have that kind of power. So, um, but, you know, I think you are right to be concerned. And that's why I say keep everyone safe. The best thing to do is to sit in the room um, and let them process their emotions and, you know, just sit there being a calm, loving presence. It is very hard to do that when you feel like your life is in danger. And so at that point, you just have to say, I'm sorry, I have to leave right now and, and leave. But, I, you know, there's no good answer to that one. It's just really, really hard. Um. Next question is um, from someone who says that they're intrigued by your point about how low frequency sounds can trigger fight or flight response. And they're wondering what your view on using binaural beat um, is, is in calming or helping with regulation. So that's an awesome question. Um, so uh, that the information I, I took this out of my presentation because it was too long, but there's a whole theory called polyvagal theory. Um, it, it was coined first by Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S. I actually don't recommend going to watch any of his presentations and so on because he's, 
he's a researcher and he uses very technical words. He's a lovely human being, um, but it's it, he can be pretty hard to follow. <laughs> um, anyway, he has worked with a company called Integrated Listening Systems to develop a protocol, which is called the Safe and Sound Protocol. And it actually retrains your ears to uh, not respond as big as they do um, to low frequency sounds like that. And so um, the, the, that safe and sound protocol is similar. So um, I believe what you're talking about, there, there are several of these uh, listening therapies out there that are designed to, um, you know, uh, retrain your, your hearing so that you, you process those low sounds differently. Um, I, I feel like I need to give a caveat there um, that uh, um, that it it so my kids did some listening therapy before the safe and sound protocol and my older son it was a miracle for him it worked so well like it worked so well that teachers were stopping me in the hallway and saying what did you do to your son that's incredible so when my younger son was so reactive i thought great we'll do the listening therapy it'll be wonderful it had zero impact on him <laughs> And so it didn't end up working. And that's one of my frustrations with listening therapies is that we don't know who they will work for and who they won't work for. But the ones they do work for, it can be profoundly helpful. Has COVID made it harder for kids to deal with feelings of frustration? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's any way to understate the answer to that. It has been really, really hard. And for a whole lot of different reasons. Probably the main one is that our kids don't feel safe, right? And things are very unpredictable. Like you might have to quarantine tomorrow because somebody in your class exposed you to COVID and you have to go home for 10 days and do school a different way or whatever. Like things are so, your teacher may leave in the middle of class because they get a test result. I, they, I've heard all sorts of really just really upsetting stories. I mean, stories of teachers passing out in the class from the stress of what they're dealing with. And so for kids, that's very unnerving that the adults are having a hard time. And guess what? We are having a hard time. And denying that we're having a hard time actually makes our kids feel less safe because they're like, oh, wait, something big is happening here and nobody wants to talk about it. But you don't want to give them like, you know, you don't want to scare your kids. You just want to give them enough information. The other thing I'll just offer is that online learning is not for everybody. Now, I've seen some kids with ADHD who actually did great because <laughs> I had this one client, she had an exercise bike set up in front of the screen and she was busily bicycling away. And then sometimes she'd run around the room. She could move around as much as she needed to. Um, during class and she did great during online learning because she didn't feel like she could do that um, when she was in the classroom, but she could do it when she was on the screen because nobody cared. Um, but then there are other kids who that online format really did not work for, for a whole host of reasons. Um, so I, I won't go into all that, but I'll just say that it was incredibly dysregulating for many children. I I have never in all of my life seen such a crisis of mental health as I'm seeing right now in kids. It is truly an emergency. I have many kids who have ended up in psych hospitals um, because they could not handle their big emotions around things. Plus they're not getting, they don't have their friends to be with, so they're not practicing, you know, being with their friends and how to self-regulate while being with your friends, which is actually a really great way to learn to self-regulate. So it's just been really, really hard. And this is why the Surgeon General issued, you know, his warning that, that we are heading into a mental health crisis. It is bad out there. So yes, COVID has made it much worse. Our son is resistant to the teachable moment after a moment of rage. <laughs> Yeah, because he can't deal with uh, what happened. Um, so they're wondering if you have any suggestions. 
Yeah, that's a toughie. So my younger son, <laughs> my younger son regularly says either A, I don't want to talk about that, or B, <laughs> I don't want to talk about my former self. That's one of his favorite lines. Um, and it makes it hard to reflect back on you know what happened and it makes it hard to engage him in you know collaboratively problem solving and i've really tried to be you know non-judgmental and just say you know, you were having a hard time it's okay we just need to figure out how to do this he really doesn't want to engage with it and so what i've had to do as a parent is i've just had to be a detective so i have to figure out what is causing the problem for him you know i I have an example from many years ago when we were at a party in a house that had no carpeting and no uh, curtains or anything. And uh, the kids were playing ping pong in the basement. And at some point, somebody dropped, my older son actually dropped a bucket full of ping pong balls on the floor and the ping pong balls bounced all over the place. And it was very loud. And my younger son ran over to my older son and bit him like broke skin on his his arm and I was I was like what happened here so we had to leave the party of course and it was it was horrible it was just an awful event and I implemented the consequence which was when something like that happens I won't let the kids be alone together without an adult with them for some period of time so I, I need his brother to feel safe and so what I said is okay you know if you want to be around your brother then I have to be in the room like you can be in separate rooms or you know you have to have an adult mediating that and a couple of weeks later I realized oh he's really sensitive to sound I think that triggered the fight or flight response in him when the ping pong balls bounced on the floor I still, I mean, that's been years ago, and I still can't talk to him about that. But I now know, be careful about, um, you know, those loud noises, because they really trigger him. So, yeah, I, I, I wish I had some good answers. I really do feel your pain. It's hard with a kid who, I, and, and I do think it's rooted in shame. I think they feel a lot of shame. And so they, they feel like the best way to deal with the shame is to, uh, pretend it didn't happen um, you know and <laughs> I guess you know maybe when he's 50 he can figure out that it's not his fault but it is his responsibility and he needs to figure out how to how to handle it but yeah there are no easy answers there the the next question is how do you deal with consequences um, do you wait until they have totally moved through all of the phases for sure <laughs> For sure, because there's no rational brain. So consequences only work if that thinking brain is online, right? So if they have tripped into the rumble or the rage, there are no consequences that are going to work. They're out of control. They can't control their behavior at that point. That is a bottom-up behavior. Consequences only work on top-down behaviors. So if they are behaving that way because they're trying to get something um, and, and you know, they're, they're being manipulative, then a consequence will work. But if it's triggered for some other reason, like they cannot do it and they don't know how to tell you they can't do it, implementing a consequence is not going to work. Um, especially in the middle of a rumble rage. Um, there's a, a strategy a friend of mine taught me. She calls it the big cookie test. And the, the test is, you know, if you want to figure out whether your child can or cannot do something, offer them a really enormous reward. You know, like if you write, you know, a paragraph, I will give you a kitten <laughs> or a big cookie. Um, and if they're able to write the paragraph, when you tell them they're gonna get this giant reward, then you, you need to watch how they wrote it. So did they write it and it was totally easy and they, you know, they, they just, you know, knocked it off and they're like, okay, now I get a big cookie, right? Um, then you're, you're thinking, okay, that was definitely a case of they didn't want to do that. So that will respond to a consequence. That kind of behavior will respond to a consequence. However, if they did it with 
and it was really hard for them and they pulled everything together and managed to get through it, that means it's hard for them. That is genuinely hard for them. So implementing a consequence might motivate them to do that hard work, but if they don't have the resources to pull it together to get through that, they may not be able to do that. And then the third outcome, of course, is that even when they get a kitten, they still can't do it, then you know that that is definitely a skill they do not have. So, um, you know, thinking about that consequences work for kids who are engaging in top-down behavior. So many people are asking about other adults in the child's life or maybe the babysitter or, um, you know, another parent or teachers um how do you get everybody in their in their world um understanding what they're going through and kind of um helping them go through this process and, and every so that everybody's on the same page <laughs> oh <laughs> such a great question and you know something so my kids are older now my kids are 24 and 19 so i've been doing this for a long time and Boy, at some point, you just get so tired of having to educate everybody about what's going on because you're thinking, oh, my goodness, like, haven't people figured this out by now? And the answer is no, they have not. And your job is to educate, educate, educate. So finding the resources that you have that will allow you to communicate to them what is going to be helpful for your child, that's, that's what you need to do. The, the other thing I'll just, I, if it's a babysitter or somebody who's going to be interacting with your kid on a regular basis, you know, you can, you can talk to them about the rumble rage cycle, talk to them about, um, uh, you know, I, actually I have a, a very much shorter version of this talk. It's five minutes on YouTube. So if you search for Rumble Rage Cycle and Sarah Wayland, you can find a little five minute video about this. You might share that with them, you know, and just have them watch that and say, hey, this is part of what's going on with my kid. Um, that can be helpful. I think also understanding what those uh, triggers are for your child. So for example, if you have a kid who has rejection sensitivity, right, then you want to say, you know, if they feel like they've disappointed you, that may trigger, you know, a big response like that. And so, you know, the answer is you have to reassure them that you haven't disappointed them and so on. And so understanding what your child's triggers are um, based on who they are as a kid. So for my son, I would always say things like, you know, a really loud noise will definitely make my kid upset. So you have to educate them about, you know, what it is about your kid that, that gets them that way and then how to help them if they move into that. That can be a process of educating. The, I feel compelled to say that some people are not educable. <laughs> so you, there, <laughs> I've sadly been involved with cases where well-meaning people just don't know how to respond in ways that help your kid. Um, in that case, you want to talk to a supervisor and ask for help. So just say, I think these people are trying. They just don't have the training. They don't know what, you know, what my kids' triggers are. They don't know how to respond. I do find when you're talking to teachers, very often um, the teachers are desperate for information to help them figure it out. And um, so they, they want to know like how to help the kids in their classroom. And so, you know, if you can give them some guidance on that, that's great. If you find they're not receptive to that, then you may have to, you know, reach out to the vice principal and just say, hey, you know, I know you've been working with me on this for a while, um, but, you know, I feel like teacher X needs more training in how to handle kids who are having a hard time. So, um, but the answer is you have to educate people and we just keep having to educate them. Um, and I, I wish that wasn't true. I wish like everybody knew all the things you've just learned about here, but unfortunately they don't. And that's why I still give presentations because it's, it's really important and our kids deserve, deserve adults who understand them.